In the last part of our introduction session, I want to talk about unsupervised learning and generative learning methods. So starting with unsupervised learning, a simple example of an unsupervised learning method that is quite well known is the principal component analysis method. So principal component analysis takes a data set here denoted by the data matrix X, which is number of data points times number of dimensions and then computes the covariance matrix of this data and diagonalizes it via solving this eigenvalue problem. Uh, that means we compute the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this covariance matrix and if you now do a basis change so you essentially rede redefine your axis uh, to uh, be along the eigenvectors with the largest eigenvalues, then you get a new coordinate system in which the first axes point along the directions of maximal variance. And as a result, you can now use this new coordinate system for dimension reduction by throwing away all the directions with small variances and only keeping those with large variances. And that basically gives you a dimension reduced representation of your data. Principal component analysis is a linear, shallow learning method. You just essentially take the data, do a simple linear algebra computation and you have the result. So um, the optimization in this particular case is trivial because it is done by just solving the eigenvalue problem. However, because uh, this method is linear, it is also quite restricted. So, for example, if the data lie on a circle, which is a one-dimensional manifold, uh, the, the PCA method will not be able to perform a dimension reduction because it cannot represent, it cannot unroll the circle, it cannot represent it using a linear method. So a neural network version of such a dimension reduction method is the so-called autoencoder. In an autoencoder we uh, take data in the input neurons and we have an output which is of equal size and dimension as the input but we force the network to go through a latent space so that means a, a lower dimensional uh, latent space or code space called Z here and the task of the network is to minimize the difference between the reconstructed X prime at the output or called uh, y hat here in the loss function and the x input. So as before in supervised learning we have a loss function and we minimize this loss function uh, by training the parameters using the backpropagation method but in this case the loss function is not defined by fixed output labels it is actually defined by comparing the predicted output with the input. So, um, because we are not using labels, this is an instance of an unsupervised learning method. Another famous unsuper learning method or class of unsupervised learning methods are clustering methods. So, dimension reduction, manifold learning, clustering, these are typical instances of unsupervised learning methods. In all of these cases, we have to formulate a loss function, so an optimization problem, in order to turn these methods into deep learning methods. Another class of unsupervised learning methods are generative learning methods. So let's talk about generative networks. Generative networks have been used uh, in machine learning for decades, but they have been uh, they have become very very popular in the last seven or eight years due to the development of new uh, important methods in the regime of directed generative networks. The aim of such generative networks is to generate samples 
from an uh, interesting and usually complicated target distribution that we are interested in. For example, let's say we want to sample images of a certain type, such as images of handwritten digits. And maybe we want to condition this on the digit that we want to sample. So the task for the network is to generate images of handwritten numbers for, for example. So in general, this is approached by using the idea of transformation of random variables. So we sample from a simple random variable distribution in the input, for example, a multivariate Gaussian distribution, as you see here, and then learn a transformation from these inputs into samples of the target distribution, for example, these points that are distributed around a circle, as you see on the right. Now, um, one famous example of such generative networks and so-called directed generative networks is a variational autoencoder. Um, the idea borrows from the usual autoencoder, which is just doing some sort of dimension reduction, as you have seen before. So we also start from an input, for example, an image at x, then go into a lower dimensional latent space and uh, then decode this late space code again into an output which is trained to resemble the input. But the difference is that it, in addition to just trying to reconstruct the input while going through a lower dimensional latent space, we also have an additional loss which tries to shape the latent space distribution into um, a shape that we can easily sample from, such as a Gaussian distribution. And as a result of this additional regularization, we now can throw the encoder away after the training and we can directly sample from the latent space and then use the decoder in order to generate samples from, um, for example, the images we are interested in. So let us first look at how such a variational autoencoder organizes the space or the latent space into um, images that are in some sense similar to each other. So these are images generated by the decoder of a variational autoencoder that has been trained on image data sets. On the, um, on the left, these are faces, face images. On the right, these are MNIST handwritten digit images. And what you see here is that in the four corners, top left, top right, top right bottom left, and bottom right, we have um, four images that were actually in the data set, and we go into the latent space representation of these images and then decode them again. So these are essentially reconstructions of existing images. And what you see in between are latent space interpolations between these images. So you just linearly interp interpolate between the latent space representation of those images and then you use the decoder to generate what is at this point in latent space. And you can see that you get a smooth interpolation between the images, but the important thing here is that the intermediate images are indeed meaningful. So in particular in the faces you see that intermediate faces are really looking like faces, which would not be the case if you did the interpolation directly in pixel space. If you did it in pixel space, the intermediates would essentially all look like garbage because you, you mix just uh, images on the pixel space and essentially you get noise if you do that. Uh, so that means you have trained this latent space to actually represent the manifold of the set of data that you're interested in, like faces or handwritten written digits. Um, here is another example of such a variational autoencoder applied to chemical data. So here these authors have 
um, use the variation autoencoder idea to encode chemical graphs. So in other words, the description of chemical structures of many, many molecules and thereby try to learn the manifold of chemicals or at least the set of chemicals in a certain database. And then again, the idea is that we can interpolate between different molecules in latent space and we can generate additional molecules, new molecules perhaps that we are not in our data set that are nevertheless meaningful because they know something about the manifold on which valid molecules lie on. And this gives us the opportunity or the possibility to generate new molecules that, that we don't know about yet. And the hope is that this um, these representation or this organization of chemicals in latent space somehow also correlates with the function of the molecule. So we can, for example, start from a molecule we know about and then move along latent space in a direction in which a certain property, such as the fluorescence intensity at a certain wavelength, increases and then generate new molecules and hope that these actually really have an improved fluorescence intensity. And in this particular um, study, the authors indeed did that and then did calculations, quantum mechanical cal calculations, to verify that you can find better fluorescent molecules in this way. Another famous example of a generative network architecture is the generative adversarial network. In a generative adversarial network, we uh, start with an input that is actually noise or is uh, samples from a random variable distribution that we can easily generate from, such as a multivariate Gaussian distribution. And we train then two networks simultaneously in an adversarial fashion. So these two networks play a game against each other. And one network is the generator, which tries to transform the noise variables into fake samples of the type we are interested in, such as images of a face, let's say. And we compare this to this output to real samples using the discriminator network. But the discriminator network does not know whether an input it gets comes from a real sample or from a generated fake sample. So now we train both networks such that we reward the generator whenever it fools the discriminator and we reward the discriminator whenever it makes a correct dis decision of whether a sample was real or fake. And uh, if converging, these two networks converge to a situation where the discriminator will uh, not be able to discriminate from generated and real samples and will basically output 50% every time, whereas the generator will output samples that are indistinguishable from real samples. These here are examples of images of bedrooms generated with an adversarial network. These are interpolations between existing bedwork images with an adversarial network. And I should really add, these are relatively old examples, so you can find much cooler and more impressive examples in the more recent literature. Uh, but I want to show you uh, this interesting idea. The um, idea of these generative networks is on one hand that you can generate interesting um, samples of images or other objects that you're interested in, but also that the latent space is organized in a way so that you can do simple operations in it. You have seen that with interpolations before. Here you see it with arithmetic, arithmetic operations. So we train again in this case on image data of human faces. We take samples of um, a man with glasses in latent space. We subtract the latent space vector of a man without glasses and add 
latent space vectors of women without classes or the latent space and then we put this through the generator network and you can see we obtain samples of a woman with classes that actually look like um, real samples of, of human faces at least to some decent approximation. So with this um, I am finished for the introduction session. So uh, you have seen an introduction to shallow machine learning in the very beginning. We have understood the basic concepts of what is a loss function, what it means to be a machine learning problem, how we train the parameters of a machine learning algorithm, what are hyperparameters and how we can train them. And we have also looked at neural network architectures, feedforward neural networks, dense feedforward neural networks, convolutional neural networks, and finally we have looked at unsupervised learning and generative learning. So with this we are in good shape and we can go into the individual topics in much more detail, which will be done in the next lectures. Thank you for your attention.